to accomplish our God-given destiny, we're going to have to go against the flow of this world system. You are sons and daughters of the Most High God. This lesson, this final lesson, is on the new wine, okay? So, let's go to Isaiah, and let's read here. Do not remember the former things. That's the way God used to move through you or through others. Nor consider the things of old. Behold, look and see, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? In other words, are you going to be able to recognize it? Some people won't, some people will. Who are the people who are going to be able to recognize it? The people who come through the wilderness successfully. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. So what was once a parched, dry ground now becomes a very fruitful field. That is what God said would happen. If you, uh, um, if you look at this, and I, I want to just read from my notes because this is so important. The move, the new thing that God is about to do, it's not new to God, it's new to us. Okay, so we have to remember 2 Corinthians 3.18 says we're changed from glory to glory. Okay, how does every change come? There's a wilderness in between it. So, so embrace it because that's where he does the new thing. That's where he brings us to the next level of glory. Often we resist change. Why? Because we're people of habit. We get comfortable in a pattern, and I'm really one like that. I mean, ask my son. I've eaten the same breakfast for over 10 years. I mean, just the same thing every morning, right? So, I, 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 hey, I'm one that has to fight this. My natural inclination is to strive and make something happen. You know how Paul said, I'm the chiefest of sinners? I used to tell people, I am the chiefest of master strivers. And the other thing is, is I'm a, I'm a person of habit. So it's taken some very godly sons and a very godly wife to help me to make changes because I embraced the old and it was really hard for me to go to the new. But yet now I'm like almost 60 years old and I'm like, bring it on. Let's go do something new, God. I, I love it, you know, because my experience, I've seen what happens. Do you see what I'm saying? All right, so to talk about this, this change, I want to go to Luke's Gospel, the fifth chapter. I love, love, love this, and that's why I saved it for the 10th lesson. One day... Some people, everybody say some people, people. said to Jesus, John the Baptist's disciples fast and pray regularly, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees. Why are your disciples always eating and drinking? Now, first thing we got to ask is who are the some people? Were they the Pharisees? Well, we can find out for sure who this is in Matthew's account of the same thing. One day, the disciples of John the Baptist came to Jesus and asked him, why do your disciples fast and pray regularly? That's Luke's account, like we do and the Pharisees do. Okay, wait a minute. Now we got to talk about this. This is the disciples of John the Baptist. Now, I want you to think about this. <clears throat> These guys had made a lot of sacrifices to follow God because just a year earlier, John the Baptist is on the cutting edge of what God's doing in the earth. Think about it. Everybody's going out to the wilderness. He's the prophesied one to come to prepare the way of the Lord. These guys, in order to join John and become his disciples, they had to live in the desert. Do you understand? Their food was locusts. Okay? I, 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 did you hear what I said? Locusts. That's his food. Wild honey. That's his food. Okay? He's living in the desert. He's got a camel coat over him. He's got a leather belt around him. This is the guy they're working for for several years. Okay? So now their boss is in, in jail. And Jesus is not playing by their rules. 
He's going to the mafia parties. He's eating and drinking. They didn't touch anything that came from the vine because John came as a Nazarene. So, you know, they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're, you're, you're not serving God the way we're serving God. So they come, and obviously John fasted a lot. Yeah. So they're like, what's up with this? You guys go to all these mafia parties. You're eating all these feasts. We're fasting. So what are they trying to do? They're trying to bring Jesus back to their method of serving God. Because one year earlier, that's the way God was moving on the earth. Locusts, wild honey, right? Being in the desert, not the rich places of the mafia guys, yeah. drinking the finest of, from the vine, right? So they're like, we've had it. we got to talk to him about this. So Jesus, I love the answer he gives. Jesus responded, do the wedding guests fast while celebrating with the groom? Of course not. Okay, so what Jesus is saying is, why in the world do my disciples have to fast? Okay, you've made a religion out of fasting. If they got a question, God manifested in the flesh is right here. All they have to do is come ask me and I'll give it to them. So I love the way he exposes their, their religious, you know, a religious spirit always hangs on to what God did while he resists what God's doing. So, so the Pharisees are saying, Moses is our father, but they're resisting the son of God who's right before him. And that's what these guys are doing, right? But now look what Jesus says. But someday the groom will be taken away. Everybody say, taken away. Okay, this is the emphasis of this statement from them, and then they will fast. Now, is Jesus talking about food? Does he now go back to what they brought up? Yes, I can see that. But can I tell you what Jesus, I think Jesus is really talking about? He's talking about a fast of the presence of God. Someday he'll be taken away. What happens when he's taken away? There is a fast of his tangible presence. Are you seeing this? Now, how do I know this? How do I know that this is the true interpretation? By what he goes on to say. Look at this. No one puts new wine into old wineskins. For the new wine would burst the wineskins, spilling the wine and ruining the skins. Now stop right there. I'm going to talk a lot about this, okay? So first of all, what is wine a type of in the, in, the, in the Scripture? It's always a type of the presence, the tangible presence of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Be drunk not with wine, where is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. In other words, Paul is saying being filled with the Spirit is the real thing. People who get drunk on wine, high on drugs, are looking for the satisfaction that can only come by being filled with the new wine, which is the presence of the living God, right? Yes. So, no one puts new wine in old wineskins. Now, what's a wineskin? Okay, so they harvest the grapes, they trample them, do all that kind of stuff. How many of you know that there's storage time for wine? Well, what they used in those days was sheepskins, okay? And they would call them wine bottles, but they were made out of sheepskin. Now, sheepskin, before they put the wine in it, was very flexible, very pliable. It would bend, right? They would put that juice into that, right? And it could hold the wine. But after months and months and months, the atmosphere of the Middle East would dry up. It would absorb the moisture out of the sheepskin. So now, once they poured the wine out, the sheepskin's no longer soft and flexible and pliable. It's now rigid and stiff. It's brittle. So if they were to put more juice into that skin, it would burst the skin, and it would, you would lose the wine. Okay? Now, when I'm in my wilderness, this second one, when I'm the youth pastor, God is showing me this, right? And first of all, I want to say one thing. Jesus said it would spill the wine, you'd lose the new move of God, and it will ruin the skins. So you, you see that the skins are the container. What contains the fresh move of God, that's... That's movements, that's churches, that's us, that's individuals. So not only is God concerned about losing the fresh move of the Spirit, He doesn't want to see the skins broken. Yeah. So in other words, I, I see this as God saying, if you want to remain rigid, stiff, and brittle, you can keep your old wine, but I'm over here doing this, and you're going to be in the past, and you're not going to have the power that this is going to have. So here I am praying, and God's showing me. I'm making you into a new wineskin, and I'm like, so as I'm praying, I see a vision. 
And I see a vision of this wine bottle being turned over and every bit of the wine poured out. And I was like, oh my goodness. You have to pour out the wine in order to make the skin new again. Because you know what they did when they poured all the wine out? They would rub it with olive oil and soak it in. First of all, they'd soak it in water for days. Then they'd rub it with olive oil and it would make it tender and pliable again. Well, if you look at water, is the washing of the water of the word. Remember what Job said? I held fast to your words more than my necessary food. So the time when we're in a dry place, man, get in the word of God. You know, one of the things that I do before I ever read the Bible in the morning, I ask, say, Holy Spirit, I've been reading this Bible for 38 years, but I can't understand unless you help me. And I'm asking you to show me an aspect of Jesus I've never seen before. And I'm telling you, I do that even after 38 years of walking with God. Okay, because I know how important the Word of God is. It, it's, we're washed with it, right? Then you rubbing of the olive oil is what? Prayer, okay? So what he's saying is, if you do this, then what's going to happen? You're going to be a vessel that the new wine can be poured into, which is a new, fresh move of the Spirit. Remember, it's not new to God, it's new to us. And if you look at all the past moves of God, what do you end up with? You end up with institutions. You end up with people that are stuck. I've gone to churches, and I see that pastor is still stuck in the 80s. I mean, he's doing what we did in the 80s, singing some of even the same songs, the decor. I'm looking at pastors that are stuck in the 90s. I've seen pastors stuck in the first 10 years of the 2000s. I mean, it is so important that we cry out, for a fresh move of the Spirit, no matter how long we've been walking with God. Are you getting something out of this? Now look what Jesus goes on to say. New wine must be stored in new wine skins or renewed wine skins. But no one who drinks the old wine seems to want the new wine. They say the old is just fine. So here's the deal. Um, every time there's been a fresh move of God in my life, the real battle I face is I want to stay with the old. Because I like the old. I've gotten used to it. Right? I'm a, I'm a person of discipline. I'm a person of habit. I like this. But yet God's saying, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. I want to do something new. I mean, I've watched it with messages. Like right now, I'm, I'm preaching Killing Kryptonite like crazy everywhere I go. And I mean, like literally on the Bethel tour, we saw over 5,000 people get saved. It's crazy. I've seen this in the past where God really puts his hand on a message. But I have tried to go back and preach those back messages just because I need a message to preach, and they're so flat. Yet, when I preached them 10 years ago, when he was having me for that year preach it all over the country, it was so powerful. But now, with this wilderness message, this is why you've never heard me preach it in all these years. I wrote this first book in 1991, and I read it recently, and I was like, that was a prophetic message for the 90s. This book needs to be totally rewritten. That's why we're rewriting it and launching it in January of 2019, because it needs to be brought up to date. And here's God putting it in my heart. Why? Because he's preparing all these prophetic voices. Young people, your age, right? Older guys like us are going to dream the dreams. And he's like, I'm getting ready to do something fresh and new. So what? Don't get used to the old. Don't sit there and say, but I like the way he did it a year ago through me. I like the way he did it three years ago. No, he's doing something new. Can you say amen to that? Here's the bottom line. You ready? This is what Jesus is saying. It's much easier to stay with the old than to go through the diligent seeking process that is required to move into the new. That's good. There's what keeps a person from going to the new. Make the decision in your heart right now. Right now, make it, make it, make it. Before the difficult time comes when it's dry. Because when it's dry, what your temptation will be to revert back to the old. It worked, and it will still work because there's a residue of that old. It will still work, but you won't be on the cutting edge of what God's doing in the earth. All right, so I'm, I'm going to have to wrap here. But what I want to do, I want to do some final important points. Number one. Release, listen to me carefully, release how you think God's going to promote you. Okay, just, just, just get rid of the way that you believe God's going to promote you. I remember I used to constantly figure out, how does a boy that grew up in a town of 3,000 3, people 
who went to Catholic Church all of his life, who knows really hardly anybody, how does God raise that young man up to preach to the nations? And I remember I used to try to figure out how God was going to get Lisa and I into the preaching ministry. And I remember one day, I was like, oh, I bet it'll happen this way. And the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said, you just figured out another way that I'm not going to do it. (laughs) And it's amazing. I never was able to figure out how God was going to do it. Because he does it. Because God is the one that gives the promotion. All right? So, clear your heart of, here's number two, clear your heart of offense with God. Paul said in Acts 24, 16, he said, And herein do I exercise to always stay free from offense with God and with men. Many times when we're going through a wilderness, the one we want to blame is God. The one we're upset with is God. The one we get bitter with is God. But we're too scared to admit it. If that has happened, first and foremost, be honest. Pour out your heart to God. Be open. Be honest. Jeremiah didn't complain to his friends. He went straight to God. And you've got to say, God, I'm, I'm so stupid I, because you're perfect. You love me with a perfect love. My own natural father didn't love me anywhere near as much as you love me. And so obviously I'm the one missing it here. I'm the one that's kicking against the goads here. And you've got to release any bitterness or any offense that you have towards God. Number three, don't complain. It is the fifth thing that kept Israel out of the promised land. It is what caused them to be desert wanderers for the rest of their life. When we raised our children, you're going to think this is crazy, but we disciplined our children for rebellion whenever they complained. Didn't we? Okay. Why? Because as I said before, complaining is an affront to authority. It says, I don't like what you're doing in my life, and if I were you, I'd do it differently. So... I remember at a time in my life, I was on a fast in the mountains of Georgia. Yes, there are mountains in North Georgia. And I was using this guy's house. And I remember I was at the point where I was almost proud of myself for not complaining. I'd gone through some pretty sticky situations, and I made sure I protected myself from complaining. I remember waking up in that little cabin in the mountains of Georgia, and I heard the Holy Spirit say, I hear the complaining in your heart. I didn't get out of bed that morning. I rolled out of that bed straight to my knees. And I said, oh, my God in heaven, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. So protect your heart from complaining. Number four, set your mind and your heart to stick it out. I want you to look at Hebrews chapter 10. This is so good. Patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all that he has Promised. I want you to look at it from the message. It's, it's so good. It's still a sure thing, but you need to stick it out. I love that. You need to stick it out. Staying with God's plan so you'll be there for the promised completion. I love that. Number five, if you stick it out, promotion will come. Listen to me again. Promotion will come. All right, I want you to look at 1 Peter 5. So be content with who you are. And don't put on airs. God's strong hand is on you. He, this is God, he'll promote you at the right time. Okay? Remember, your time is usually not God's time. Psalm 31, my times are in your hand. That's part of his lordship in our life. Live carefree before God. So what that means is you don't have to worry about bringing it to pass. God will see to it that it comes to pass. He is most careful with you. And then I want you to see Psalm 75 which says, for exaltation or promotion comes neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south. Why? Because it comes from the north. But God is the judge. Remember, his throne is on the sides of the north. He puts down one and he exalts another. I've meditated a lot on this scripture and I thought, God, what am I going to do the day if you put me down and exalt another? I hope I respond correctly. I know that John the Baptist made the statement, he must increase that I may decrease. But I do know after being in the dungeon, John sent his disciples to Jesus and said, are you the coming one or do we look for another? Are you kidding me? He saw the heavens open and knew the spirit of God. That's why Jesus sent the message back, quoted Isaiah and then said, P.S. John, blessed is he who is not offended with me. Promotion will come. Know it. Number six, keep the most important goal before you. If you look at Ephesians 1.11, 
it says, in him we also have attained an inheritance, being predestined. People get nervous with this word. According to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his word. Don't get scared of the word predestined. Please, just because people have misapplied it and misused it. Let's look at it so you're not scared of this word. The prefix pre means before or prior to the beginning. The word destined or destination is where you will end up or the finish line. Put the both together and this is what you get. To set the finish line before the start. God wrote out your life story before you were even born. It says in Psalm 139, before I was born, you wrote out my entire life story. Every moment of my life was recorded in your book before I was even born. He has a great plan for your life. He has a future, one that is filled with hope, joy, and promise. Don't give up. What is the finish line? What does he predestined us to? Paul tells us, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined he set the finish line before we began to be conformed to the image of his son. That is the number one goal of Christianity. That is the number one goal of God creating us to be saints. He wants us to conform to the image of Jesus Christ. In ministry, we can get off target. If you look at the Maccabees, they were determined to keep idolatry from Israel. They were 200 years before John the Baptist. They started out okay, but their, des their, their focus wasn't accurate. Their focus wasn't the heart of God like David and Moses. And so they ended up becoming the Pharisees. The number one focus, endpoint, your internal GPS, is to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. If you're a pastor, that's where you're directing your people towards. If you are a, be a believer, a disciple of Jesus Christ, you, your goal is to become like him. And finally, number seven, as a final word, I want to read 2 Corinthians chapter 4 because I think it sums it up beautifully. It says, Therefore we do not lose heart. Don't lose heart. Don't give up. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. I love that. Now look at this. He goes on to say, For our light affliction, and God considers the worst trials we go through as a light affliction, is, which is but for a moment, remember a moment for God can be a few years, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. So what do we do, Paul says? Here's his next statement. While we do not look at the things which are seen, don't look at your circumstances, but at the things which are not seen. That's the word of God, the promises. Till the time that his promises came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. But look at those things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Your calling that God has placed upon your life, guess what, guys? It's eternal. No one can ever take it away from you. There is no one that can ever get you out of the will of God. I mean, Joseph's brothers tried it. They said, we're going to kill him and we'll see if he'll ever lead us. But you know what? They couldn't do it. Saul tried to do the same thing with David. He couldn't do it. The only one that can get you out of the will of God is yourself. Israel complained. They murmured. As a result, they never walked in the promises that God had for them. I want that for you. We need you to fulfill your calling and your destiny because we need what God wants to do through you to be done in this earth so we can get our job done and get home. So with that, I want to pray for you right now. Some of you might be in the beginning of your wilderness trek. Some of you might be at the end. Some of you may not be in the wilderness. You're in a oasis right now. It doesn't matter. Chances are very good you're going to face one here sooner or later. So let's pray. And I want to believe God. Father, I thank you for everyone that's gone through this course. I thank you for their life. And I thank you for the calling that you place on their life. Their calling is significant. There is not one person watching me right now that has an insignificant calling. God, you said even the parts that are not seen are even more valuable and to be honored greatly than the parts that are seen. And so, Father, I pray that you would in give the strength, the fortitude, the endurance as my brothers and my sisters do what they have learned in this course, and that is to obey your word and to stay focused on you and on what your word states. I pray strength into your life. I bind the forces of darkness that have tried to hinder you and stop you, and I release you into the wonderful plan and will of God. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. It's been a real pleasure, a real honor to be able to share with you just a little bit about the wilderness. I'm sure in your Bible study now, the Holy Spirit will open up much greater aspects of it and you'll continue to build on your understanding so that you do the right thing in the right season and get the right result. God bless you.